Okay, so, um, well, hello, uh, bonjour, konnichiwa, um, guten tag, buenos dias, Daniel Hesel, uh, ni hao. Uh, I, I can't really speak American, but uh, I, uh, I did consider doing the whole talk in a, in a really bad American accent, but uh, it would be really probably painful for everyone involved. So I hope you all understand me here in Texas. Um, so, my talks, what's that supposed to mean? And um, most of what I'm going to tell you is true. Um, I've taken a few liberties to kind of fit everything into 25 minutes. Uh, but my name is Paul Barry, um, and on the internet, I use the username 3 Monk in lots of places. And people often ask me, what does that mean? And that's a reasonable question. Um, it's actually a Japanese yojijukugo, which is a four-character expression which is itself a four-character expression, so there's a kind of nice sort of, um, it is four-character four expressions all, all the way down. It's kind of um, But getting back, the expression um, mikabozu in Japanese, you know, literally means three-day monk, but figuratively, uh, it refers to someone who uh, starts things and doesn't finish them. So, you know, you've got this kind of image of someone who joins a monastery, but after three days, they find that the ascetic life is too much for them. And, you know, we're all a bit like that. Um, I know I am. And so I actually chose that username kind of to, uh, to prod my own conscience into finishing the things I started. But just how do you write Three Day Monk in kanji, in Japanese? Well, three is really easy. One stroke is one, two strokes is two, three strokes is three. Uh, and day isn't so hard either. What is the day but the passage of the sun across the sky? And that's what the, the next character is. It's a stylized disc of the sun. That's uh, an old version of it um, from sort of oracle bones from uh, 3000 BC. Over time, it's got a bit squared off. Um, but it's still one of the simplest characters. So that's three day. But what about the monk? Uh, you, could probably, you could try to draw a picture of someone in monastic attire. But if it's going to get a bit fiddly, it's really hard to do. And as you can see, that isn't really what's happened. So there's a more kind of general problem here, which is if our writing system is based on drawing pictures of stuff, how do we represent things that we can't draw pictures of? In other words, how do we represent abstract concepts? Well, one way is to use things that we can draw, uh, which sound the same. Um, if you've ever seen one of those things, uh, for, typically, for, typically for kids, called a rebus, then you might understand how this could work. So, for the sake of argument, suppose we wanted to say, um, we wanted to write, I hear you. Well, I can use a, a picture of an eye for I, um, and I can use a female sheep for you. Um, <laughs> that's the best I could draw. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, ear, well, it's not exactly the same as here, but it's close enough, and in some dialects it's probably the same. Um, it's actually quite tricky to draw an ear, and you know, exactly what an ear looks like might depend on your culture. <laughs> um, but I digress. So we can put all these together uh, to get I hear you, and probably people will understand what we mean. Um, but we might decide that I and you are a bit ambiguous. So we decide to draw a little kind of stick person next to them to indicate that they're, they represent people. And that is more or less what the, the ancient Chinese did. So for example, how do you write image um, if everything you draw is itself an image? How do you express the concept? Um, well, the word in Chinese uh, is xiang, which is conveniently exactly the same as the word for elephant. And <laughs> an elephant's a pretty easy uh, thing to draw. This is an old um, oracle bone elephant, uh, which I've redrawn in Inkscape, so it's not exactly the same, but <laughs> close enough. Um, and, you know, it's got legs, it's got a tail, it's got a trunk, so it's got a tusk, so it's recognizably an elephant. And over time, again, it's become stylized and squared off, and perplexingly, it's kind of become rotated through a, a quarter turn. But you can still, if you sort of turn your head on the side and squint a bit, you can still see an elephant. Um, so you can use the picture of an elephant to represent the concept of image. But uh, sometimes you might want to make it clear that you're talking about a person. Uh, an image of a person. So how, how do you draw a person? Well, we drew some stick figures earlier on, but the Chinese reduced it down to something simpler. 
the, the defining characteristic of Homo sapiens is obligate bipedalism. In other words, generally speaking, we walk around on two legs. So you can draw something like that, and it's recognizably a human. And that sort of looks like these days. Or possibly it came from two arms. It's not entirely clear, looking at the old characters. Either way, it's something that, that's recognizably human. Um, so that's what the Chinese character, the person is. But if you put it together with elephant, you get a thing that is about people, um, and it's pronounced like elephant. And 3,000 years ago in Chinese, and conveniently still today, um, means image or statue or portrait. And this kind of combination, which is a character for the area of meaning, the bit on the left in this case, uh, and, and a character for pronunciation, makes up by far the largest group of Chinese characters. Uh, and in fact, of these kind of component parts, there's only a few hundred of them. They're called radicals. Um, and so the problem of uh, learning to read Chinese isn't quite as hard as it might seem at first. Although, over millennia, um, sound, the pronunciations have changed quite a bit. Um, so writing Chinese, on the other hand, is still relatively hard. Here's a shopping list for uh, jiaozi, uh, which is dumplings. And the author of this is a researcher from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences with a PhD. Um, and he started writing some of these characters, given up and written them phonetically. So even for educated speakers, it can be quite hard. But Japanese is a bit harder still, as we will see. So back in the fourth century, the Japanese didn't have their own writing system. They borrowed Chinese, and there's no shame in that. We use the Latin alphabet and the clues in the name. Um, but Japanese and Chinese are completely unrelated languages, and Chinese makes a lot of assumptions which aren't even that good fit for Chinese always. But for Japanese, it's a very poor fit indeed. So the Japanese came up with a system called uh, Kanbun that involved firstly writing the sentence in Chinese, that's the, the left hand column. Secondly, they annotated it with a a set of transformations, uh, kind of like a computer program that explains how you turn the Chinese sentence into a Japanese one. And that's the little annotations down the uh, left-hand side of the leftmost column. Then they would execute this program, and you can see the arrows. First of all, you move the third character down to the bottom, then you swap the uh, uh, sixth, fifth and sixth characters, then you move the third character down to the, uh, whatever it is, sixth place, seventh place, sixth place, whatever. Um, and then you take, you fill in all the blanks, and you read the whole thing as in Japanese, and all that's down the right hand side, you've had to go and make up on your own to, to work out how to pronounce it. So this was the way that Chinese, that Japanese was written for a very long time. But luckily, some other people realized that you could just use the Chinese characters for their phonetic values, and use just one character for one syllable. Um, and this became Manyogana. Uh, that in turn was simplified into Hiragana by taking these uh, complicated kanji and writing a kind of cursive abbreviation of the strokes, or into katakana, which is the same kind of thing, another way of doing it, based on taking just a part of each sign. Um, so there's only about 50 each of hiragana and katakana, which is kind of manageable. It's, it's about the same order of magnitude as Latin or something, which has, well, 26 characters, but actually about 52, because we have lower and upper case. Um, and it's entirely possible to write Japanese just using those 50 phonetic characters. And that's what children's books do, um, and till receipts as well. But real life is a bit more complicated, because uh, firstly, there's a load of loan words from Chinese, um, and those are all written in the original kind of Chinese kanji, um, with a kind of Japanese pronunciation. But to, to add on to that, Japanese words entered, uh, Chinese words entered Japanese in about four different ways. So you've got the pronunciation from Wu or from Tang or Song or Ming errors, and each of these characters can have several of these pronunciations. Uh, then, on top of that, um, Chinese characters are used to stand in for, for Japanese nouns and adjectives, with um, extra phonetic characters used to indicate things like um, the past tense and so on. And so that means that, that uh, you end up with something like this, where red is katakana, black is hiragana, blue is a, a Chinese loan word, 
and purple is uh, a Japanese word that's written with uh, a Chinese character. And it means that um, each character can have several possible pronunciations, which probably reaches its apotheosis in, in this character. Um, you might recognize it from the Japanese beer label, um, where it means draft, uh, as in draft beer. Uh, and in Chinese, it has one pronunciation. Um, but in Japanese, it can be pronounced, depending on context, as shō, se, bi, or u, or o, or ha, or ki, or nama. And so there's, there's uh, eight possible pronunciations for it, <laughs> and none of us are But Japanese, even despite all that, isn't that bad. There are more complicated writing systems, or at least there were. So slightly earlier than the Chinese, uh, the Sumerians in Mesopotamia developed their own writing system, uh, which is called cuneiform. Uh, and they started out drawing pictures of things, which became more squared off over time. Quite, quite, and rotators as well. Rotating characters seems to be quite a common thing in history. Maybe because it was like, easier to write on that angle. And then, because they were using reed styluses to press things into soft clay, they simplified everything to kind of pointy marks that you can easily make with a, a clay stylus. So everything's sort of those little sort of wedge, wedge shapes. So that's actually what cuneiform means. It means wedge writing. Um, and the Sumerians solved the problem of uh, representing abstract concepts in the same way, um, using readers. Uh, they'd use similarly pronounced um, characters to stand in for things that they couldn't draw. So in the case of life, which is they pronounced as til, they would use the character for t, which is an arrow, and that's as in a major looks like an arrow in a bow, it's obviously become quite simple for quite a time. And they also used something called determinatives, which were signs to indicate what kind of thing they were talking about, you know, a bird or a name or a tree or something like that. And over time, somewhat like the Japanese, they reduced the number of symbols down and made, made much more use of the kind of syllabic pronunciations of signs. But this then starts to get rather confusing and ambiguous, so they took to a kind of multiple redundancy approach using logograms and phonetic signs and determinants all at the same time. So here is how you write raven in um, uh, cuneiform. So the second character on uga is the word for raven. But it could also be pronounced as naga, which means soap, or enesh, which is a city, or nisaba, who was the patron saint of that city. And so to make sure people knew which pronunciation was the one they wanted, they put an u at the start and a gu at the end, which kind of sort of tell you it's meant to be uga. And then, for good measure, they put the determinant of a bird at the end. So you take all of those things together, and you know that you're writing raven. And the Sumerians were supplanted by the Akkadians, who, who spoke um, an unrelated language, and adopted the Sumerian writing system for themselves. They, they regularized this bit into uh, just five distinct strokes, and um, they used the Sumerian pronunciation for uh, phonetic signs, and they used also the characters to represent Akkadian words. Um, and sometimes the same sign could be either. So that's actually quite a lot like Japanese. And it seems really unwieldy, I know, but uh, cuneiform stuck around for 32 centuries. You know, writing systems seem to, once they get traction, to, to last for a really long time, no matter how, how bad they seem to fit. And then, of course, there's the Egyptians. And that's kind of the same thing. They, they drew pictures of things they could and used them to represent the pronunciation of things they couldn't. Um, so, you know, they, there's a mouth which is pronounced something like Ur, and a sun which is pronounced something like Ra. No one really knows because they never wrote they never the vowels down. And the little line underneath is something that they used to indicate that this was actually a mouth or actually a sun. The default was for it to just be a phonetic pronunciation. And so you end up with something like this, which is how you write the uh, name of a god called uh, Kepri. Um, the scarab beetle is the pronunciation of most of it. Then they've added around the edge three other symbols with the same pronunciation. And then the E, and then God. And you can write, say, uh, hieroglyphics in either direction. The way to tell that this one is from left to right is that the people always face the start of the line. So we know that God's facing left here. So we know that he's at the end of the line. Um, so that's, that's um, Egyptian, but what's more interesting, I think, is where it went next into hieratic, uh, into demotic, and these are kind of simplified scripts using a lot of phonetic. Uh, they, they were predominantly phonetic. 
Um, but then it was the people in what is now Lebanon and Syria who, who gave us all the alphabets that we have today. They took a small number of the Egyptian hieroglyphs and used them to stand for um, individual consonants. So that's, that was the Proto-Sinaitic um, alphabet, and that evolved into Phoenician, um, which gave us something which was you know, more linear, more abstract. That became Greek and Latin, Aramaic, Hebrew, and in fact, a whole, a whole array of languages, um, including uh, modern uh, things used today, as Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, um, Georgian, Mongolian. Um, and I haven't even talked about the Brahmic script yet, uh, South Asia or the Gez of uh, Ethiopia. And those are called Abgidas. They're a bit like alphabets, except that each character has a kind of default vowel attached to it. And then you can add a, a diacritic to change the vowel. So the default one is, in, this is Devanagari, is in Hindi. Um, the default is Ka, but then you can change it to Ki, or Ku, or Ke, or Ko, or a whole load of other uh, vowels by adding diacritics. And this is uh, Gez used in Ethiopia, where you're going to care, and then you can, add, you can turn it into a kuh, a ki, a ka, a ke, a ka, or a kol. But um, that's, those scripts, the Brahmi script, which no one really knows the origin, might have come from Aramaic, so it might even go all the way back to Egyptian. But we do know that it's given rise to a whole load of other scripts. Um, lots of ones used in India, um, Thai, Lao, uh, Khmer used in Cambodia. Possibly even um, Korean might have developed from an archaic script that was developed from Tibetan, but no one's really sure about that. But, you know, the, um, all of that is a kind of long winded way of trying to communicate a simple observation, really, which is I think that human writing has been guided by two main limitations. Firstly, you can't draw everything. And secondly, you can't remember everything. And there's a reason that most of the extant writing systems are fairly simple. The, the hand script, the one used in Chinese and Japanese, is kind of an outlier, but even that isn't tremendously complex. Um, you know, even eight pronunciations for one kanji aren't so bad, any more than O-U-G-H is in English, or um, no vowels written down is in Arabic or Hebrew. But enough about the past. Nowadays we have icons and we have custom icon fonts and we have emoji, which is a really interesting word in itself for reasons that I won't go into right now, but ask me later. Um, and that's just online. Offline, all kinds of devices have symbols representing you know, their functions, their statuses. Here in the US, uh, it seems like most of the kitchen appliances are marked in, in, in English. And the same kind of things true in Japan, they tend to be written in Japanese. But in Europe, electrical appliances are sold in dozens of countries with you know, each of them has one or more of its own languages and there's much more of a tendency to try to avoid human language in favor of a pictorial language that just work anywhere and some of these symbols share a common vocabulary so you know what that is the power symbol right it's the IEC 5009 standby symbol you see it everywhere and you kind of know what it means um, some of them only make sense in context so if you see that on a weather map, you know it means the sun. On my washing machine, it means dry. <laughs> and then, of course, there's things that don't really make any sense at all. Anyone care to guess what that means? I think it's rinse and drain on, on my washing machine. I say my <laughs> washing machine. It's not mine. It's the one that came to my apartment. And uh, I wouldn't actually buy anything that's that horrible to use. <laughs> and the really perplexing thing in my, on that washing machine is that there's actually plenty of space to write things in English. A load of things are already written in English. And it seems like this is just a really poor aesthetic choice that someone made, rather than any attempt at communication. But with that in mind, uh, I'd like to take you on a tour of some icons that I've cited in the wild. So, shout out if you know what these mean. <laughs> no one. Windows. That's, that's really interesting. So that is select all on Android. And I only know that because I hit it once by accident. <laughs> and so... Oh my 
spicy Google. <laughs> so I was, I was talking to one of my uh, colleagues about, about this talk um, a few weeks back, and uh, I was giving some, some, some uh, telling him about some of the, the icons I was going to talk about, and I showed him this one, and he said, oh, is that what that does? And he's got an Android phone, so apparently no one knows it. <laughs> How about this one? That one is code from GitHub. It was view source at one time, but I think raw source, but they've changed that. Um, I do, I, I'm, I'm sort of mocking it a bit. I, I do have a lot of, uh, I do understand well the motivation for this kind of thing. Um, at one time I worked on a, a website that was in four different languages. It was in Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and English. And it has Japanese designs, and they would give us all these sort of designs, these layouts, that expected every word in the navigation and so on to be two characters long. Uh, and that didn't work for English at all. Um, it wouldn't work in, in German, even less, in fact. <laughs> so, how about this one? Hot water. Hot water. So when I was a kid, I always used to wonder why there was a picture of, I thought this was a sailing boat, um, <laughs> on the dashboard of my parents' car, and it's, it's a temperature gauge. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't really know why. Um, how about this one? A lot of noise. Uh, <laughs> uh, OSX hates you. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, I, I'm actually feeling a lot of parts and that no one knows what this is, because um, when I learned to drive, um, the first time I went out on a long journey, um, after just after getting my driving license, um, I was puzzled by this. I've been driving for a while, uh, maybe a few hours, and then I was puzzled by this warning light on the dashboard. And I knew something was wrong because it was red and it had an exclamation mark. Um, and it was quite difficult to drive. Um, but I thought it's because something's wrong, right? Um, it turns out that uh, I had the handbrake for the fucking brake days and on. And I, I did eventually realise what was wrong, but not before I kind of destroyed the brakes. I had to get them replaced at great expense. Um, my parents, on well, my parents' car, actually, were delighted about that. Um, I think it's actually meant to look like a pair of uh, brake shoes around the edge of a uh, brake drum or something, but it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, how about this one? You know what this is? <laughs> Same, yeah. It's, it's from something from the uh, from a previous era called the floppy disk. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of interested about this one because it seems to everyone the same. And yet, you know, no one has floppy disks anymore. There are young designers who are going to move into the workplace in a few years who have probably never even seen a floppy disk. And you know, what, what are they going to do with this icon? Are they going to turn it into something more abstract? Um, maybe we'll just get rid of save altogether because it's probably a bad idea. I don't know. Now, the world of Java applications is particularly rich in um, icon art. Here's Eclipse. Now, I've never been a Java programmer, so I can't even guess what half of these icons mean. I guess that the picture of a kind of, like a scarab beetle or something is a bug or debugging. I guess the green arrow, the green circle within the uh, triangle is probably run. I don't know what the kind of red briefcase is. I don't know what those things with pluses are. I don't know why there's balloons coming out of a manila folder. Or some kind of highlight of hand, there's a plethora of arrows. Uh, it, it seems to me that this stuff is just there because of the of pictures. Um, so how about this one? Ah, uh, you might have thought so. Did you copy the stories linked to your clipboard on the pivotal tra track? It. I did consider putting a whole load of things from Pivotal Tracker up, but because um, I'm obliged to use it, and it has so many bad icons, but I thought that would be a good um, And so I, I guess the uh, final one is this. Hamburger. The hamburger ring. I mean, it doesn't really look like a hamburger to me. It looks like that, so, that black one that Aaron has in, uh, in, in Japan. <laughs> There's not, not any hamburger I care to, it's kind of rectilinear too. Um, and, it's, it's come out of nowhere in, in the last few years, I think. Um, but on the other hand, although it doesn't really mean anything, it's so widespread that it seems to be quite well understood. And I think the meaning is 
if you click this or press this, something will happen. It's <laughs> <laughs> just a, uh, we give up kind of like. <laughs> I was using something on my, on my phone last night, so, uh, and it's got two icons like this. It's got the, I can almost be an Instagram. It had the wider hamburger menu, which was actually a menu. And then it had this kind of really narrow hamburger menu, which is another kind of menu. And it didn't really, yeah, no obvious difference. But so what's my point with all this? Um, I'm not actually sure there is a single point to be drawn. Um, but you know, one of the things is that I want to, to observe is that written language has evolved over thousands of years um, into a highly abstracted way of representing constant complex ideas. So we have alphabets like Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, or Korean Hangul. Uh, we've got abjads like uh, Arabic and Hebrew, abugidas like Devanagari or Thai, slavaries like Japanese Hiragana or Cherokee. Um, and the most complicated extant writing system is probably Chinese, but even that is made with a smaller set of common elements. On the other hand, though, we're currently in a situation in which every website, every app, every electrical device, every vehicle has its own visual vocabulary. And asking people to, to, to learn and remember and be able to use all of this is quite a big demand. Um, I expect that it will follow some... Oh, sorry. It's bad. Yeah, I expect it will follow some of the same evolutionary paths as writing has done. Um, but whether that means simplification and kind of uh, reduction and getting things down to, to shared elements, or whether it results in a kind of explosion of different and mutually incomprehensible dialects, I think remains to be seen. Thank you. That's me. Um, there's some credits there, which I guess you're not going to read now. But yeah, you want to come to me? There I am.